The Drum, the Doll, and the Zombie by Brad Strickland and John Belair's Chapter 12. If anyone had looked into room 315 at Mercy Hospital that morning, he would have thought that a crazy man had come to see Dr. Coote. Professor Childermass had unpacked his black case and had made his preparations. Seven candles burned in the room, two white ones on tables at the head of Dr. Coote's bed, two red ones on the floor at the, foot, at the bed's foot, two blue ones between the red ones, and between the blue candles, a single sinister black one. Besides, one of the white candles rests in a silver holy water sprinkler. The professor had also taken out three small cloth bags full of dried cornmeal. One bag held red cornmeal, one held black, and the third held yellow. Working carefully, the professor dribbled little lines of the powdery substance on the floor, making what the voodoo priests called a bebe, a mystical drawing that produced strong magic. His friend, at Miskatonic University had given him a number of designs that supposedly harnessed good magical forces. The professor repeatedly consulted a drawing of one of these designs as he shaped the lines of cornmeal into a pattern that involved a valentine heart, intersecting lines with feathery twig-like markings at their ends, and a central circle with an eye in it. Then the professor took several bright red silk neckerchiefs from the bag. He tied one of these around his head and knotted others together to loop around his middle like a sash. That done, he paused, bowed his head, and said several prayers, asking for strength, courage, and the assistance of heavenly powers. Then he faced the moment he dreaded. The professor went to the bed and slipped the pillow from underneath Dr. Coote's head and placed it in the center of the veve he had drawn. He used his pocket knife to slit the pillow open, and he glanced fearfully inside. Sure enough, although the pillow still had the texture of a bag filled with feathers, he could see something revolting and frightening. It looked like a coiled reptile with a coiled reptile with scaly, sickly green, sickly gray skin. The professor's heart pounded as he gently shook the thing from its nest inside the pillow. Then he stepped back. For a moment, the creature simply lay motionless, a confusing, tightly coiled bundle of arms, legs, and scales. It was a pale, slimy gray white, and though it had felt soft, the professor could see the outlines of bones through its scaly skin. Slowly, ever so slowly, the incredible thing began to move. First, a limb straightened out, revealing itself to be a leg, ending in a grotesque foot with long shows and, with long toes and sharp claws. It looked like a bird's foot, except that it had four forward-facing toes and a viciously curved short claw back where the heel should be. Then the arms unclasped. The being pushed itself into a standing position, and as it did, it grew. It was unbelievably skinny but it was taller than the professor when, it, when at last it stood upright. The legs and arms were little more than stems with knotted knees and elbows. The belly was shrunken, the rib cage hanging over, the, over it like the lip of a cavern. The terrible face had snake-like yellow-green eyes with slits for pupils, a hooked nose, and a thin, wide, sneering mouth. A tuft of white feathers on the crown of the head waved as if slowly waggled. As it, as it slowly wagged round its head from side to side on a curving, skinny neck. As the professor watched in sick fascination, the monster gasped for breath, hissing quietly. Then it started to step toward him menacingly, but when its clawed toes were over the outline of the heart, it stopped and backed up a pace. It glared at him with hatred. Professor Childermass felt cold sweat creeping over his face. His heart was thudding like mad, and his mind shrieked for him to run away from the stretched-out monstrosity. Yet he forced himself to smile. No, no, he said softly. You are held in check by magic stronger than you are. You can't get me. But my friend, I am going to settle your hash right now. He pulled from his pocket a brown knotted cord, stiff with beeswax. The creature hissed again when it saw what he held. It clawed at the air as if it wished to attack him. Now then, said Professor Childermass grimly. Here we go, and may I say first that you deserve this for having the audacity to take the twisted likeness of my poor friend, to take on the twisted likeness of my poor friend. Then the professor clamped, then the professor chanted something in French, which he spoke fluently, and the monster's eyes blazed its defiant malice. As you are tied to the soul of Dr. Charles Coote, finished the professor, this cord binds your evil power to you in the name of all the holy saints of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, I conjure you to release your hold on this man's soul. Behold, I undo the power that gives you shape and form and strength. He 
he united one of the 21, he untied one of the 21 knots of his cord, holding it so the creature could see. It moaned softly and staggered. The spell was working. With grim satisfaction, the professor said the last part of his spell again, and then untied another knot, and then another one. Each time, the creature reeled as if in pain, and before he untied each knot, the professor repeated his conjuration. He tried to sound bold and confident, but he grew more and more alarmed. He knew that each knot he untied hurt the creature more. If he could torment it to the point of releasing its hold on Charles Coote's soul, the cord and the bebe would have no more power to hold the monster, and it would be free to attack him. On the other hand, if it stubbornly refused to yield its grip on Dr. Coote until the professor undid the last knot, then the evil creature would die. It would die and take Dr. Coote's soul with it, leaving him bedridden for the rest of his life. Professor Childermass was fighting a savage war of wills and gambling that he could force the monster to give in before he, un he had to untie that very last knot. Fifteen knots remained, then twelve, then seven. Now Professor Childermass's hands were shaking with strain. His eyes stung as sweat rolled into them, and his voice kept piping high with dread. With dread. But he continued relentlessly. The beastly creature had dropped to crouch on all fours, its hate-filled eyes glaring at the professor as it gasped for air and hissed its anger. The seventh knot was undone. With a sinking heart, Professor Childermass repeated his command and began to untie the sixth and the creature collapsed. The candles burned a sickly blue for a moment, then went out. Curls of smoke rose from the extinguished wicks. The professor groaned, horrified. Had he killed his friend? Had he... Roderick? said a weak voice. My God, it is Roderick. Professor Childermass shouted in joy. Dr. Coote was sitting up in bed, trembling, his voice weak, his eyes wa wide and wild. But he was awake. Then another sound, a horrible, mindless growl, stopped the professor's rejoicing and brought his heart to his mouth. The pillow thing had risen into a crouch again, and its mad, empty eyes blazed. Now that it no longer possessed a human soul, it was free to ignore all the professor's magical restraints. With a savage roar, it leaped, and before the professor could reach the holy water sprinkler, it slammed into his chest, knocking him back. His head banged painfully against the wall, and his glasses flew off. The horrible creature's talons closed on the professor's throat, and the mouth split open to reveal hundreds of needle-sharp teeth. The professor ducked just in time, and the teeth clicked on air. Help! shouted the professor as he sank to the floor. The monster weighed very little, but it had the writhing, squeezing, squeezing strength of a python. Its legs clenched, up, clenched the professor, and its long, taloned fingers pressed hard, cutting off his air. He feebly tried to beat the brute away, but his hands flopped weakly on its horrible, cold, slimy sides and it took no notice of his blows. He tried to grab its wrists, but its skin was as slick as the surface of a slug, and he could get no grip on the thing's arms. Charlie, gasped the professor desperately. The holy water! The creature cu cut off his wind, and everything began to go dark. The professor rolled on the floor, knocking over the candlesticks, and came to rest with the monster perched on his chest, bending low, opening its grinning mouth to rip out his throat. The professor could see only dimly through a billowing black fog, he could not get his breath or even scream. Then he felt moisture, like a shower of rain, and the monster howled. Dr. Coote crouched on the foot of his bed, like the white rock girl on her stone. He clutched the holy water container, and he sprinkled for dear life while he recited the Lord's Prayer in English. <clears throat> the creature let go its hold in the professor's throat and lurched away, trying to shield itself from the deadly spray of water. Attaboy, Charlie, croaked the professor, crawling away from the monster. Give it to him. Three cheers and a tiger for the good guys. More holy water hit the thing, and with a ball, it suddenly exploded. Feathers flew everywhere, a blizzard of pillow stuffing. The professor st staggered up, retrieved his glasses, and whooped. A trembling and exhausted Dr. Coote sat back on the bed, his face white. Only then did both men hear the pounding at the door. Professor Childermass had taken the precaution of locking it, and now the nurses were clamoring to get in. The professor rose, brushed stray feathers off himself, and strode to the door. He threw it open to find two wide-eyed nurses staring in. Yes, he demanded. What is the idea of all this noise? This is a hospital, you know, ladies. There are sick people present. The nurses gawked at his attire. One red bandana hung rakishly on his head. More bandanas encircled his stomach. White feathers had settled behind his ears. On top of his head and on his shoulders, more floated in the air and drifted in heaps across the floor. 
Behind the professor, Dr. Coop was sitting up in bed, trying to figure out how to take the feeding tube out of his nose. What? What is going on here? The older nurse finally stammered. Professor Childermass drew himself up. What does it look like? He retorted in a crabby voice. I came to cure my good friend, Dr. Coot, and I have done so. Where your so-called modern medicine failed, I have succeeded. I know just what he, I knew just what he needed all along. And what was that? Squawked the dumbfounded nurse. A good, old-fashioned, rousing pillow fight, roared the professor. He reached out and slammed the door right in her face. Between Dr. Coote's remarkable recovery and Professor Childermass's bellowing insistence, the hospital happily released the patient within the hour. Professor Childermass helped Dr. Coote into the, prof into the professor's bedraggled old tweed topcoat. Because except for his striped pajamas and slippers, Dr. Coote had no clothes of his own at the hospital. The professor helped his old friend downstairs. Dr. Coote was very upsteady, unsteady on his feet and very lightheaded, though for the first time in many weeks he felt his old self. Then the professor drove his Pontiac up to the hospital door and eased Dr. Coote into the passenger seat. As they roared off for Durham, the professor hastily filled, it in, filled Dr. Coote in on what had been happening. So, he finished, we are not out of the woods yet. That hag still has a devil doll of your likeness. My ritual will protect you temporarily, but unless we can find and destroy the doll, she will be able to make you helpless again. There is an alternative, said Dr. Coot grimly. You know a magician's spells are all broken when he or she dies. For a moment, somber silence filled the car, and then the professor sighed. It's too bad that neither one of us is a murderer, he said. Dr. Coot grunted his agreement. In a few minutes, the professor turned the Pontiac in Dr. Uh, Dr. Coot's driveway. He got out and went around to help his friends, to help his friend into the house. That's funny, said Professor Childermass. Young Lamort should have, should have arrived here by now with the boys, but the house seems to be empty. Who? asked Dr. Coot. Todd Lamort, replied the professor tartly. You remember, your own graduate student, don't you? He put the key in the lock. Roderick. I have never had a graduate student named Todd Lamort in my life, said Dr. Coot in a querulous voice. You are out of your head, answered the professor. He was the, he is the nicest young man I have met in many a moon. Oh, my God, he opened the door, and both he and Dr. Coot stood transfixed. All the furniture had been taken out of Dr. Coot's living room. Ugly idols and hideous masks hung all over the walls, and on the floor they saw a sinister tracing of red, white, and black lines, making an image like this. I know what that is, croaked Dr. Coot in a terrified voice. So do I, responded the professor. It's a voodoo symbol. Someone has turned your house into a temple of evil. Dr. Coot's voice trembled. With fear and outrage, as he asked, what fiend would do such a thing? Slowly, Professor Childermass put both hands over his face. Oh, God forgive me, he moaned. Charlie, I think I have turned Johnny and Byron over to the forces of darkness. He began to cry helplessly, uncontrollably, like a man overcome with grief and guilt. And that is the end of chapter 12.